Good morning and welcome to Julie Talks Money from the studios of KCAA Radio, 1050 AM. This is a very special day. I'm going to be doing actually two hours today and I'm super excited to have as a guest in my show, Rudy Kosuma. And we're going to be talking a lot about the real estate office of the future, talking about kind of the evolution of it and how it's been going and where we see it headed. So it's going to be a two-parter and I hope you'll stay with us for the whole time because it's going to be really exciting. But first, as I said before, this is kind of home to the California lifestyle, Southern California lifestyle. And what we have is the goal is that you can enjoy the lifestyle that you want, wherever it is that you live, and find a way to fund it through lots of different things with passive income and other things and money. The main models of the show and for my philosophies are how to earn the income, grow your income, keep your income, and then protect your income. Those are the main and most important things, I think that have to do with everybody and everybody's lives, right? Uh, I also had mentioned last week or two weeks ago that I've been giving myself a challenge to live on cash and not use credit cards, not use debit cards, and not use uh, anything except cash to make any purchases. And it's really, really darn hard, <laughs> I'm here to tell you. To try and do something like that is uh, such a challenge because every place you go wants you to use a debit card or anything that you have on your phone, right? Everything is popping up. It's now an advertisement. If you're looking at YouTube, boom, there's an ad. And if you have something in email, there's going to be coupons and a great deal. And here's this. <coughs> and, and everything is buy now, buy this, buy that, buy that. Oh, but you have to have a credit card to do that. Or you have to have a debit card. Not only that, but you also seem to not be able to pay any bills these days without a credit card or a debit card or something online that is linked to a bank. The banks are really starting to control way more of our finances and it's shocking that you really can't hardly pay cash for something. Oh, how about your phone? Can you just swipe it with your phone? Can you <laughs> do this stuff with your Google wallet or your iPhone, whatever that app is? I don't know, I'll find out from somebody. Um, you know, we can do everything, it is interconnected. We know that you go on email, you wanna log in. Well, you have to double check it because they're gonna do a verification on your phone. Everything is connected and almost instantly, which in its own way is kind of scary stuff, but that is the way of the world. Uh, I can go on a rant, and I might later in the show, about banks and something else in the fees, but first, I'm going to tell you the tidbits, because I always like to have some tidbits here in the show that are some things that are maybe a little lighthearted and fun and having to do maybe with money as well. Uh, and the first thing I want to tell you is that reports have been online shopping in bed is on the rise. Nighttime online shopping has increased by nearly 25% in the past year. Data shows that the amount of money spent between midnight and 6 a.m. in 2008 compared with 2017, I mean 2018 versus 2017, has vastly increased. So that means a lot more people are on their computer or on their phone or on uh, whatever device they're on these days, could be a tablet, laying in bed or doing night owl things, but they're buying, they're shopping, and again, making us all vulnerable to that little thing that's in our hands and whatever ad pops up on that. Uh, that is one of the other things. Now, Kanye West has recently purchased a $14 million property in Los Angeles. That's where they're going to be shooting Keeping Up with the Kardashians. Now, $14 million for Kanye seems like a pretty low end property. Mm. I don't know, maybe Rudy will discuss that <laughs> a little bit. Uh, but that is going to be the scene of a lot of the stuff with the Kardashians. Um, uh, one of the things that also has been said is never lend money to family. Well, you know, between the, the two Kardashians, they've got a lot of money, they probably don't have to worry about that. But the biggest cause of marital fighting is money. Not much of a surprise there, right? So if you and your spouse fight over money, what makes you think that lending money to a family member will have a happy ending? Doesn't matter if it's a sister or a father or a brother or an uncle or a nephew, something. Basically, it won't have a happy ending According to a poll, 43% of readers who lent to family or friends were not paid back in full, ever. And 27% never even got a dime back. Now, my uncle was very fond of saying, never lose, lend money to anybody that you can't afford to lose. And I think that that's just really a very, very good policy that everybody should have. If you can't afford to lose it, don't lend it. It doesn't matter if it's a family member, a friend, or anybody else. Let's consider that. So I'm going to go back just quickly to the Kardashians. We've talked a little bit about school and the cost of tuition, and of course that's going up. Definitely been in the news this week with uh, some of the other stuff having to do with the Varsity Blues scandal, that sort of thing. A lot of people are wondering, again, how is Kim Kardashian going to law school? 
As I said, she's studying to be a lawyer. Well, she's not really in law school. California is one of the very, very few states that you don't have to go to law school. And I bet you didn't know that, did you? You don't have to go to law school in order to become a lawyer in California if you find a qualified person who is a practicing lawyer that is willing to take you on and mentor you. Now you have to work for them for one year and then you're eligible to take what's called the baby bar. It's not a bar exam, but it's a baby bar. And even law students in law school have to take that after the first year. And if they are able to pass that, and basically it says that they've got the aptitude or they've got some of the ability or smarts that they've learned some things in the first year, then they are allowed to go on to study the law some more. Even in the law schools, you can wash out in that first year if you're not able to pass the baby bar because then you may not even be able to go on to the second or the third year. So that's what Kim Kardashian is doing, and you can do that too, and it doesn't matter if you're 22, 25, 40, whatever. If you're able to find an attorney who's willing to do that, you can basically save a heck of a lot of money, maybe shortcut the process, but not by much because you still have to study a lot, but certainly save on the 60 or $100,000 in debt you can get into with law school. Also, for those people, like myself many, many years ago, who really thought about going to med school and tried to do that or wanted to do that in undergraduate school, there's a tremendous amount of competition. We all know that, right? And you need to either major in science, biology, chemistry, something like that, and you're up against hundreds of people in your class who are also going for the same thing. Well, guess what? You don't have to do that. You don't have to go and beat your head against a wall for four years in pre-med at a regular school. You can graduate in art history. You can graduate with a degree in, I don't know, I'm not veterinary science, uh, in English, or poli-sci, whatever it might be. And let's say a couple years later, you decide maybe you want to go to law school after all. Well, you can actually find schools that will allow you to go for one year, just one year, and you get all your sciences in, get all the physiology, anatomy, biology, chemistry for just one year, no matter what your undergrad degree was, and that will qualify you to have enough of the sciences to get into med school. Assuming, of course, that you can get a good enough score on the MCAT, or the MedCat. So I'm just saying, there's always more than one way to skin a cat, right? If you're doing something, whether it's education, do it legally, I always want you to do it legally, but you don't necessarily always have to follow what society says are the rules or what you think are the rules as far as college goes. And one of the things we're talking about with real estate, we'll be talking about definitely in the next couple of hours, is there are a whole lot of other ways to do real estate besides what we've all been taught and think of is the traditional model of buying and selling real estate, because most of us will do that and use an agent as opposed to selling it by owner. So stick with us. We're going to be right back with Rudy Kazuma from Your Home Sold Guaranteed as my special guest. And I'm excited to talk to you about it and learn more about real estate. Stick with us. I have to. Oh. I'm not. I turn my mic so much. Okay. So. That's my little bit. Now I can move that. So, what do you want to start with? Do you want to, we want to start with, first of all, do you want me to mention Remax at all or not Remax? And by the way, congratulations again on your ranking. That's awesome. That's great. That's up to you. Either way, it's okay. We can mm -hmm. talk about the story behind. Just a little bit? Okay. Yes. And I want to ask how you got into real estate and sure. how long you've been yeah. doing it. Yeah. Okay. And a little Maybe. bit about your story, sure. you know. Yeah. Anything. Struggle. Anything. Okay. I love that. Yeah. So. <laughs> Anything. <laughs> Anything, huh? Okay, what's your shoe size? What is it? What's your shoe, shoe size? size. <laughs> yeah. What? You said anything. <coughs> mm -hmm. So when you speak on the phone, am I supposed to hear your voice from here? Or? Yes. Okay. Not so well right now. I don't know why. I don't know, Joe, but I can't really hear myself in the mic. I hear But you I'm supposed to hear you from here. Yeah. I'm supposed to be, yeah. yeah. And if I increase the volume, I definitely hear. Oh. It's okay. Not to hear quite so much. So you hear it okay, right? You hear you hear what's going on right now. The radio. I hear the F now. Yeah, and your mic is on. Yes, it's on. Here, let me have it a little bit closer because. 
And of course, we'll hear each other while the commercials are running. Okay. Yep, so, uh, yeah, thank you. How's Sacramento? Oh, it was fun. I think it's going to be really good when we build a team there. Sacramento yeah. is average home to 300000 And you can rent it out How for much? eighteen. dollars 300000 300000 Half a duplex for $220,000. And you can rent it out for 1800 a month. I have some friends who are up in that area in Stockton, and I've been looking at it for a yeah. while. I was looking at it when you could buy houses for 40 or 30, you know, during the crash. Nobody wanted them, but I'll just I come up there with you. I think it's good. We have a couple of people. Welcome back to Julie Talks Money. I am Julie Phelan, your host, and if you have some questions or you have some concerns or other ideas that you want us to talk about on the show, please call at 951-327-8108. That's 951-327-8108. 951-327-8108. And that's not going to get you a call here into the studio. I'm just asking for your ideas and comments, but I definitely would love to hear from you. Or you can always email me at julietalksmoney at gmail.com. As I mentioned before, I'm super happy to have in the studio somebody who is not, of course, just somebody who is working with me and sponsored, but also somebody that I am beginning to call a friend and I really, really admire because he's got a really interesting... Uh, I would say even fascinating <laughs> sort of way of looking and, and uh, a visionary outlook for real estate and the real estate office of the future. And that's why we're dedicating a couple hours and we're going to be doing this in a series for the next couple of weeks as well because there's so much to cover. Rudy Kasuma, who is now the owner of Your Home Sold Guaranteed, has come back to join me in the office. Hi, Rudy. Thanks again for coming back. Hi, Julie. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. That's so awesome and that you're here. And I know you just got back from Sacramento where you're yeah. building some other stuff in the offices. But would you tell everybody, how, is, how long have you been in real estate and how did you get into real estate sales? Well, I got my license 2007. And initially when I got started, Julie, I was a door-to-door -door salesman. I was selling promotional items. I read a book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And in that book, uh -huh. Uh, Robert Kiyosaki said the number one skill in life, if you don't be successful in life, the number one skill in life is you need to learn how to sell. Sell, sales, absolutely. Right? So I grew up in a family that my mom, my dad is, a, is an employee's mindset. Nobody talk about money. Uh, the <laughs> topics of money is taboo. So no, like I'm not surrounded growing up in my family. No, no one that I know of own like a business. Nobody talk about money. So the first exposure to sales, business, and money was in that book, Rich Dad Poor Dad. Is that if you might be asking, is that a cultural thing from because you're not, you're not native born American, right? You from Indonesia. Yes, I was born and raised in, in Indonesia in high school. My my both my mom and my dad they. They work for a company. My dad is a high paid employee, work for an electronic company. Mm -hmm. My mom is an office assistant all their life. All right, so when I first read the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, uh, it's talk about the number one skill in life, it's sales, and I never been anything in sales. So first thing I did, I just uh, started selling door to door. Uh, That's a challenge. Pro promotional <laughs> items, I never grab anything, right? So promotional items, I start selling door to door, and one of my clients, one of my customers was a real estate office. So mm -hmm. in that office, that's when I start. Sell. The reason I like real estate offices back then is because if I get into a real estate office and selling my pens and my stationery, all my promotional items, mm -hmm. I can speak to all the real estate agents because this seems like independent agents, right? So once the broker, independent business, yes. Person. So once the manager allow me to speak to all their agents, basically now I, I get to speak to hundreds of potential customers at one time. So and then. That's when the, the, the owner of the company, back then the broker asked me to get my license. So two years later, I got my license 2007. So that's how I get into uh, real estate. Oh, now did they make you do, or allow you to do presentations to the whole group, like standing in front of a room, or yes. you just talk to individual agents? Different people? Uh, I do both. Uh, so uh, sometimes I do a sales, so during their sales office meeting, mm -hmm. that's when I do my presentation. So I was selling uh, promotional products where real estate agents basically print their names on like on notepads, on pens and paper and stuff like that. Was that kind of scary, you know, at first, getting up in front of a large group? Uh, yes, but no, I mean, uh, the reason I was doing it, I never worked for money. One of the teaching in that book that really uh, stood out for me was you cannot, don't, you cannot work for money. You were, the reason we are doing that, the reason I was doing that back then, Julie, is really trying to improve how to communicate with people. Because mm -hmm. no one, like, I was really, really shy. My major was mathematics. I was on the way to uh, <laughs> graduate school, going mm -hmm. to get a job at NASA. That was my, oh, wow. my, my, my dreams, right? Mm -hmm. And then that's when I came across that, reached that book. 
So, and of course, in the Rich Dad Poor Dad book, you were on the stream for being the poor dad kind of person, right? Right. Get a good yeah. job, get a good education, yeah. get a good job, you know, stay yeah. there for 10, 20, 30 years, right? right? Yeah. And do that. And obviously, like me, it <laughs> exploded the head, right? Yeah. In a way of different thinking. So when you're doing individual sales, that's one thing. And if you're standing up in front of a group, if you're shy, that's another challenge. So you yeah. had to overcome that too, right? Yeah, but I guess if your vision, like, because at the back of my mind, I really want to learn how to, I really want to learn on how to communicate on how to learn how to uh, sell. So the vision, the, the, what's going on at the back of my mind was, hey, how can, how can I learn how to be a better version of myself, right? So mm -hmm. I, I'm not worried about the pen. I'm not worried about, because I think when people are nervous, I think they make it about them. Mm -hmm. It's never been about me. It's, it's how to sh how, how to add values to the people. So that's that's how I get started. And then and when I, once I start getting my license in two thousand seven, I realized first thing I get in business, the broker asked me to do cold calling and door knocking and prospecting. Yeah, that's how almost everybody starts, right? Yes, and I remember two thousand seven, uh, the real estate office about two hundred real estate agents. At the end, when I first get my license, Julie, only five agents left. Everybody quit the business. Market started to change. Well, that was near the crash, right? Or right yeah. before the crash. Yes, right. So October, December 2007, most people quit. So first thing I did was cold calling, prospecting, door knocking. Mm -hmm. And that's when I realized that there's a problem in real estate industry. Most real estate agents, they spend 70, 80% of their time looking for customers. Mm -hmm. And then as compared to a traditional business, when I was doing any type of sales prior to getting my license, I realized that in any business, each individual person has a specific role in the transaction. Real estate is the only business that one real estate agent, they are doing all the prospecting, they are doing all the customer service, they are doing the follow-up, they put a for sale sign, they cut the keys, they follow up with the customer, making copies, doing customer service, mm -hmm. negotiating contracts, looking for homes. Right? So that's when, uh, so when I first got my license, uh, I thought, wow, I'm not good at it because when the broker asked me to do the cold calling, I was really bad at it. When every time I call, uh, people just hang up on me. It's a whole different skill than going door to door or talking to people in person, isn't it? Yes. And I go back. I went I back to the it. broker. I told the broker, I don't think I'm cut out for this. <laughs> and so the broker told me, well, maybe, maybe cold calling is not for you. Uh, maybe you should try door knocking. Mm -hmm. So I went to door knocking. I told the broker, it's the same thing. These Explain people are the angry. people who don't know what that is. What is door knocking? <laughs> Because, you know, we have a whole lot of people who've never bought or sold a house, never talked to an agent, and they may not know what door knocking is. Yeah, so in real estate uh, sales, um, when so the, the, bro the, the industry always asks the real estate agents to look for customers. So one way to look for customers is going to random house and start door knocking, looking, like prospecting Like walking through for a neighborhood, business. knocking at every single door? Yes, <laughs> and basically, to me, it's a bothering That's people. A Mm -hmm. right? It's like you are interrupting people. So in business, in marketing, like you are interrupting the clients. You are, you are interrupting the prospect, asking prospects, thinking of whether they're thinking of buying and selling a home. And again, people was just mad at me. Right? Every time I call or every time I door knock, people were just angry, because which I understand. If I'm in their shoes, I would have probably do the same thing. It's a whole different world than the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, right? Now people don't want you to come to their door. They don't want to answer their door. Yeah. People are afraid. People yeah. are just thinking that they're going to be sold something. So I think, yeah, I mean, if I had to do that before when I got my yeah. mortgage license, and it's, it's not fun to have people either tell you to go away or not answer the door. I guess it's and a you different personality. a lot of that yeah. walk in neighborhoods. Yeah, like maybe it's different personality. I know some people are successful that it just, it just wasn't for me. Mm -hmm. Right, so I went back to the broker. I said, "There gotta be a better way." How many how many doors did you have to knock on before you even got somebody to talk to you or listen to, you, much less list their house with <laughs> and you? And dog chase after you, right? I mm -hmm. dog chase after me. Oh my gosh! Yeah. yeah, because when you door knock, some people were just angry and they just let the dogs out. And I remember, I still remember. Oh. It's one of the houses uh, in Saint Gabriel or uh, in Monterey Park. I, I was knocking on the door, and the guy was just upset with me, and they just let the dog out. I have to <gasps> run to oh the, <laughs> and that's, that's really and that's when I went back to the broker. There gotta be a better way, right? Yeah. And, and uh, there gotta be a better way uh, to to do this. Mm -hmm. And what did he say? He said, said no, "No, this is it. This is the way it's done." <laughs> yeah, this is it. Uh, now, were you with, you were with a major broker? I'm assuming at that time. Yes, you don't I have was, to say who it was, but I'm yes, I was with a, a big franchise a company. Shut down right after uh, a couple of months. Then I have to move to a different, uh, another big box, and that's another issue, right? So all these big box franchise who claim to have a system, well, if that's true, 
if that's true, then every single agent in that company is doing well. But like the, you but, said, you know, yes. the one you went to had 200 agents to start yes. with, right? Yes. But they ended up with five. I've right. been to several others, I've seen others, and they, yes. they have 200 or 120, yes. and they say that's great, and all of them they'd like you to believe are yes. succeeding, if not thriving. But that's not the truth, right? That's not the truth. And according to the National Association of Realtors, no matter which brand you are with, no matter which brand you are with, only the top, only less than 1% of real estate agents are bringing home uh, 100000 uh, in annual income. Less than half a percent, netting over 250000 So the success rate is so small, oh the failure rate is so high, 70-80% uh, of real estate agents quit within the first couple of years in the business. Well, they have to spend a whole lot too, don't they, to start out being a real estate agent? I mean, I've heard that it's very expensive just to even get going, not just getting your license, but joining a board, you know, finding a broker. Yes, and, yep. and those marketing. are all the struggle at the beginning, right? I still remember first I get my license, not only I have to call, call and draw knock, I remember the broker gave me, you have to buy this, you have to buy that, you have to pay an ad for that, you have to pay an ad here, you have to pay an ad there, I was like, before I knew it, I'm spending thousands of dollars and I was, I was trying to figure out how am I going to survive, like I barely, like I'm trying to figure out, I'm trying to make money here, right? And then right. the first thing I did, I already spent thousands of dollars. And, and so that's the challenge within the first couple of months in the business. Yeah, that is quite a challenge. And I think a whole lot of people romanticize maybe real estate and they see a lot of people who are top producers and they're making a whole lot of money. Yeah. And they're like, well, I want to do that too. Um, definitely we know that a lot of people left after the crash. Yeah. But before that, when there was the run up in the prices, I think that the number of people going to get a license increased like 200% or something ridiculous. Everybody's like, oh, this is easy. I'm going to go ahead and make money. Yes. Yep. But the, the reality is real different, isn't it? Yes, we talk about the traditional industry norms and standards. Mm -hmm. So the industry norms and standards, they uh, convince real estate agents that that's the normal way to do. So when, when real estate agents run an ad, what I realize is that most of the ads talking about how good the agents are. I'm the number one. We are the biggest, right? But there is no benefits from the consumer. So later on, Julie, uh, when I learn about marketing, I realize that the... In order to be successful, we need to focus on the clients. And we'll talk about more of that when we come back. Yes. We'll take a little break right now. This is Julie Talks Money. I'm here with Rudy Kazuma. We'll be right back. <laughs> Does it sound okay? Because I'm getting, I'm getting like a lot of, I don't know if he's louder, like static, static kind of thing. And does it sound okay? Yeah. Okay. I don't know how I'm sounding to you. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit like... Yeah, it's like... Yeah. Not like I think it's the heads. Okay. I'm going to have to get some new ones. Okay. It's very really good. I like the stories. What is it? The stories are critical. That, okay. That's excellent. Okay. So when you come back, you need to talk about how you switched out and, and now you have a new system. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm going to ask, did you go from one broker to another to another or did you just, you know, look at different ways of doing it How because do the first company closed down right so the first company closed down so i'm forced to move to the second mm -hmm. one. no no i got that but did you do more before you found another way of doing it and how did you find it no oh. that's what i want to talk yes about. okay how how did you get the remax mm -hmm. yeah because obviously remax is one of the big store big box things you yes. did that for a number of years yes yes another four yeah yes. home sold guarantee yep. right. number five in the nation mm -hmm. Did you see the recent rankings? It did it again? Number five. From January to June this year. Yeah. Was it number two or number five? In the country? Nationwide. Nationwide now four, and then in California uh, after yeah. uh, in California. In California one? Yes. <laughs> also, <laughs> we are doing it till the last. So it's probably it's gonna end the last one. Our contract with Remax is in first week of November. Mm -hmm. So right after the grand opening. <laughs> That'll be exciting. I cannot hear anything when I put it on. <laughs> you can't you can hear the commercial though. Yeah. I, know, I know with yeah. us you can't. That's why he keeps keep talking to me. I'm like I can't hear. It. <laughs> Sorry. I don't know about you, but I have one ear that's better than the other now, so I keep going. Which one? <laughs>
And we are back with Julie Talks Money. I'm your host, Julie Phelan, and this is a show about money and real estate and investing and how to keep your money, grow your money, protect your money, and a lot of different things that you can do in order to earn more money. My guest today is Rudy Kasuma, and he is the founder of Your Home Sold Guarantee. And we're talking about his story and what he did since the time he got his real estate license at 2000, in 2007. And after coming to America, in before that, <laughs> not too long before that. So when we left, we were talking about how you had you, the broker that you worked for in that office had closed, and then you went to another broker, right. and then we had the crash, you know, the stuff and all the foreclosures, and people were not necessarily selling houses; they were losing them to the bank, and the banks were selling. So a lot of people left the real estate agency and business. So when did you find an uptick? When did the the market start to improve, and what were you doing at that point? So my first, uh, my first uh, transaction, Julie, was a short sale. So that's where, oh, yeah. so it, this is back in 2007. That was my first transaction, it's a short sale. And accidentally, I stumbled upon the idea of hosting an untraditional open house. The traditional open house is where the real estate agents open the house for hours and passively waiting for the buyers to come in. Mm -hmm. So back in 2007, I stumbled upon this uh, untraditional open house where I, I opened the house for a very short period of time and literally hundreds of people waiting in line in front of the house. And how did you market for that? Because most people, the open houses, they put something in the newspaper. Back then we had the newspapers, right? Yeah. And, and stuff, you'd market in the newspaper and you put out the advertisements or you had little signs on the street corners. Yes. How did you end up getting more than 10 people just happening to walk through or looking for the house struggle? Then you ended up with lots more. Yes. So uh, 2007, right after, we, I, I, right after I read the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, every Friday, Saturday, Sunday, at least three times a week, I was hosting the Cash Flow Club. So the Cash Flow Club is where people come. So I use a website called meetup.com and Craigslist where I advertise uh, the Cash Flow Club where people come. Uh, these are people, investors, who's looking to buy deals, basically based on the rich debt principles. And that was the game that he invented or created, yes, right? Cash yes, Flow Cash Flow game, game is a board game based mm -hmm. on the rich debt for that book. <laughs> So people come to my office on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and we play a two, three hours game, the cash flow game. This is back in 2007. I have no customers, I have nothing. And so we're just hosting the game. So when people come, at the end of the two, three hours game, I always ask the question, hey, is there anyone who's thinking of doing exactly this in real life? And every time I do this, we always, I always pick up between five to 10 new clients, new customers, new investors who's looking to buy deals. So I do that three, four times a week. And then every time we do this untraditional open house, that's when I bring in all the people that from the cash flow club, mm -hmm. I'm inviting them for a very short period of time. It's like 15 minutes window of time for all the investors to come take a look at the short sale. Now remember, this is 2007, there's not too many short sales going on, so it yeah. looks like a good deal. Right. I remember even when I called the bank, Julie, and we are, we are applying for uh, to negotiate for the short sale, the bank, there was no such thing as short sale department. So the bank, it was my first short sale, and the good news, it was their first the short sale too. <laughs> so I still remember I called the bank, and we both trying to figure out on how to do this. Yeah, a harbinger of things to come, right? Yeah, there was no yeah, short sale yeah. department. I think I was talking to some loss mitigation or customer's uh, collection department. Collection. Who yeah, they didn't even have loss mitigation Yes, there's no such thing as uh, loss mitigation department. So then they collect me to connect me to a manager, so we tried to figure it out. And that's when I bring in all the investors from the cash flow game to this. Uh, so it was a 800,000 home uh, at, for sale at 400,000 subject to the short sale approval. Mm, so wow. it looks like a good deal. Mm. It's like 400,000 on an 800,000 neighborhoods. And that's how we have multiple offers, a lot of buyers coming in every time we host this untraditional open house. That's great. And for a lot of people who don't know this, I've actually known Rudy since I think 2010 or so. That is exactly how I met you, how we met each other, was at your cash flow game. I think you were holding it in Pasadena. And I went not just once, but I think half a dozen times anyway. And really liked what you were doing. It was not quite an investment club, but it was sort of like an investment club. Played the game, definitely talked with other investors. Yeah. So it's not like we've only known each other for a year. I've really watched and followed your track, you know? <laughs> yeah, really it interesting. Was. And that's interesting. That was kind of when email was just really catching on in a big way. It's not, I mean, people have been emailing, but as far as notifying people of the open houses, yeah. we were doing a lot more emailing back then, right? Yeah. Yep, and that was all new. But I didn't really do email, Julie, even back then. Uh, I really believe on, I really believe on 
meeting people with, with the clients face to face and then booking that appointment so from from the investors club those are the so for the first time i accidentally stumbled upon what uh, dan kennedy called reverse prospecting where the clients mm -hmm. actually come uh, at, uh, at least three four times a week to play the cash flow game and they instead of me prospecting and chasing people they chase us so that was a uh, by accident through the cash flow game so three times a week uh, we pick up about I pick up about 20 clients so then that's the first idea of having a team system because as I was remember this is 2007 2008 Julie and ma majority of real estate agents they are quitting the business right exactly and I was like a new agent and <clears throat> we have an overflow of business right we have an overflow of business coming in mm -hmm. and so I was I was looking at the other real estate agents who sitting next to my office in that in that uh, Kohler banker office back then and I look at her they, they seem like they have nothing to do so I approached that real estate agent and asked, hey, I have an overflow of business. Would you be interested if I book this appointment for you? And then we split 50-50, there you go. And everybody yeah. say, yes, I have nothing to so do. Of course they would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's kind of- not having to work that hard, right? Yeah, so that's kind of how the team model kind of started. Started, okay. How did you expand upon that then? And, and make it much more your own because you know, obviously we know about splitting, you know, people want to do that and you usually have a buying agent, listing agent, you know, yeah. two different people. Uh, but the main thing is you have to have buyers, right? If you're going to have a property and I don't care if it's a foreclosure, short sale or anything yes. else. So back then, 2007, 2008, so all the investors that come in is from the cash flow game, from the cash flow club. And then uh, the, the real estate agent in my team was every day showing homes. And remember, this is 2007, 2008, every real estate agent was being taught to email homes. Mm -hmm. Everybody like email home. They get a website. Get a yeah, website. get a website with an IDX and to to email homes. Mm -hmm. So for the first time, we are telling the the, the real estate agents in my team that no, we gotta show homes. So that's right. when we bring people to the untraditional open house. Uh, we bring the buyers to an uh, untraditional open house where we have uh, multiple offers within a very short period of time. That's that's this is, until today we are expanding the same model. So today, fast forward today, 2019, today uh, we never do the traditional open house where, we, where the owner of the house out of their home for like four or five hours, mm -hmm. right? right? So the way we set up our open house now, we call it the untraditional open house where in a very short period of time, in a very short period of time, we bring in all the buyers coming in all at the same time, creating multiple offers in 15 minutes window of time. That's pretty amazing. Now, you have been with Remax for several years. You had a Remax franchise, and you are, I think, right now, the number one in California, right, in the last six months? And before that, you were number five nationwide and number 10 worldwide, I believe it was, yeah. right, which yeah. is a fantastic accomplishment, starting from only 2007. When did you get your broker's license and become a broker? Uh, um, probably about six, uh, six, seven years ago. Um, is that when you started with this whole concept of the, uh, the teams and the building and changing how things were done with people working together, agents the, working together? The broker license, we, uh, I got the broker license for a different reason. I think it's because, uh, because of the tax. <laughs> oh. Yeah, so as a, 10, you know, as a salesperson uh -huh. uh, on the 1099, so we, we got, we got broker license to set up our corporation so uh, we can save money on tax. Um, as a, because as a self-employed, uh, we, get, we get hit with the federal income tax, mm -hmm. the state income tax, as well as the self-employment income tax. But going back to the, the, the team model, uh, back in 2000, so the, the, the whole team system started as a simple model where every month I have 20 investors coming in, play cash flow game, and they're looking for deals. And then mm -hmm. I approach the other real estate agents who basically have nothing to do, and mm -hmm. we start uh, splitting. Um, when, when we are talking about, hey, I cannot be in two, three different places at the same time, so you go show the homes, and then I can go to show homes in different places. So that's how originally it started, and then as it evolves, uh, then we, we become more structured. Now, how did you find the homes? I mean, where were the homes coming from? Were you having agents who were also finding the home, doing not necessarily door knocking, but other marketing to find and get the listings? Or was it, I mean, at that point, you know, at the very beginning when you were starting, we were starting to see a tremendous number of houses on the market, right? Yes. That were good for potential investors to buy for rentals. Yes. yes. And stuff. But other people that wanted to buy, to occupy, owner-occupied properties, you know, their primary residence, you still had to find the houses. 
right? How was that? How were you doing that? So, well, in addition to the MLS, which every real estate agent uses the MLS, but we got to think something that's different and exclusive. When you want to build a successful any business, uh, in any business, it got to be something that's different and exclusive, meaning nobody else is doing it and only through you. So back in 2007, 2008, I was a new agent. I didn't know any better, but then uh, all I did was focusing on what I was really good at. The only thing I knew back in 2007 was just short sale. So uh, when the buyers came in from the cash flow game, I have a list of homes that has a notice of default on it. So okay. homes with a notice of default, homes that's facing foreclosure, uh, people, then, we ex- then in 2008, I expand a little bit with distress sales, meaning uh, people who are going through a divorce, uh, people that's in bankruptcy. Mm-hmm. And so that's when, so we, we look at that list and we start going after you know, we start giving the list of homes that are more likely to sell to our investors. And then we just start writing an offer. That's it. So it's really simple. Most real estate agents, the industry norms and standards are being taught to email homes. All we did back then and till today, we are just showing homes, homes that match the buyer's criteria, Mm -hmm. homes that they cannot see online, and just start writing an offer. And that's really pretty amazing. And that's a very, very strong model. You know, you don't hear about other people doing that very much. Uh, We are going to take another little break and we're going to talk a little bit more about that when we come back and talk about the buying and how you've gotten into what you're doing today. This is Julie Talks Money on KCAA Radio, 1050 AM. Stick with us. Rudy Kusuma and I will be right back. (laughs) I still can't hear him. You cannot hear? Headphones, no. No. Can you hear me in your headphones? Uh, Yes. Okay. I just, I hear it sometimes with scratching. Maybe it's the mic. I don't know. A lot of stuff. Do you want another... So now that we had kind of the history, we'll get into the current thing. You want to try these on? You want to change your headset? Hmm? So now I want to get into the, the company, the mission, the values, and that kind of thing. Because I don't oh, want to sure. get too much into the team stuff till the next hour. Sure. Okay. Okay. I'm looking to see if there's a promotional anything on here. What is it? <laughs> I'm looking to see if there's any promotional. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so that's what I did before. So I go to offices. Yeah. And just that? Well, I know you know Steve Ruppogel, right? I saw him at the chamber and I've known him oh, yes, for a long yes, time. Yes, yeah, yeah, he's yeah, always yeah, sells yeah. the formal yes, items to people. Yes. Well. Yeah, so I know that industry really well. <laughs> so you're not just talking about cutco knives, you know. And, <laughs> and then I did prepaid legal before. There's a lot of stuff. Yeah. That's, yeah. yeah. I still do that now. Yeah, prepaid legal shield. shield yeah, legal shield. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have legal shield, new skin. Yeah. But that was my first uh, all MLM. But the training was really good. I really focused yeah, on the training. The training. Really yeah. And the products are still pretty good. I had some stuff that happened. Welcome back. This is Julie Talks Money, and I'm your host, Julie Phelan, and here in KCAA 1050 AM Radio, part of the CNBC Financial News Network and the NBC affiliate, and I'm here with Rudy Kasuma from Your Home Sold Guaranteed. We're talking about the office of the future for real estate agents and how he started it, what his history has been. When we left, uh, we were talking about how you got a whole bunch of buyers and sellers, and this is kind of during the crash. What made you decide to change the model completely. I mean, it sounds like you did, and started, even though you didn't know you were starting at that yeah. time, <laughs> the office of the future. Yeah, and it started with a pain, Julie. It started with a pain, uh, not just me personally, but as an industry. As a new agent, and you, you know my story in 2007, I, do, I did everything that they asked me to do. But then there was no results. I still remember working seven days a week, 
20 hours a day. And I'm, I remember I just got married. So mm-hmm. I was my first son. And I, I just remember I was in a hospital. And my, my, my first, my, when my first son born, Julia, I wasn't even there. I actually had to show homes. Yeah, and when my second that. son born, I, I still remember because when my second son mm-hmm. born, uh, the real estate agents, the buyer's agent <coughs> called me on my listing because they couldn't open the lockbox. So I, uh, my, my baby, my, my first and second son, they both born at UCLA. Mm-hmm. And I was in UCLA waiting for, my, uh, waiting for my wife when the agents called. So I actually had to drove all the way from, Santa Mon- from UCLA uh, Hospital in Santa Monica, all the way back to St. Gabriel to open a lockbox because the agent couldn't open the lockbox. Oh, I bet your wife was not very happy with you. <laughs> you know, my wife is very supportive because my wife told me, hey, you got to go, you got to do what you got to really? do. Because yeah. remember, I, we both are we, we trying to make money. Mm-hmm. This is 2007. Sure. We just get married. We just get married, right? We are trying to put things together, and so I, I told my wife. I said, "Hey, I, I want to be here." My wife said, "No, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta sell the home." Yeah, we got kids to support. Yeah, like, who's gonna pay for these bills, right? So, so the whole idea of the real estate office of the future is started with a pain. When I say with a pain, I'm talking about how can it be? If I if I was lazy, Julie, that was a different story, right? I did everything that the industry asked me to do. Uh, they asked me to do the cold calling, the prospecting, the door knocking, the, the everything the broker asked me to do, I did it. Mm-hmm. And I worked seven days a week, 20 hours a day, and there was no result. So that, that's when it gets me thinking, there's got to be a better way, right? Because how can, how can somebody who works seven days a week, 24, uh, 20 hours a day, uh, have challenge? In fact, I actually had to send my second baby when it was, of course, my wife was working full time in a doing some customer service job. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, and, and I was showing home seven days a week, right? So when my second baby born and my parents, they are both not here. Uh, we grew up, my, my parents in Indonesia, uh, that's when I, uh, I was born. Mm-hmm. And so I have to send my second son back home to Indonesia so, so my, my, wow. my family take care of it, right? So when we talk about this idea of changing the industry, it's not like one day I wake up and, hey, let's just change. No, it's because uh, I'm, it's out of necessity, right? I was trying. Well, it's like you started at the beginning, you know. This yes. <clears throat> so many agents fail because they don't realize how much work they have to do and they have yes. to put in all that kind of work, and yeah. a lot of people are just not cut out for that. Yeah. Or that motivated. Yeah. So I accident. It's, it's by accident. I was looking for a better way and accidentally stumble upon the cash flow game that people come. Mm-hmm. I was like, wow, I think there is a better way. So you grew from there, from the cash flow game, because you've got the buyers now, you've got people interested in investment property, you've got properties, and you've got agents working together. How did that all come together to form a company, and what vision did you take from that, or take forward with that? Yeah, so slowly as the team continued to grow, I was with Kohler Banker, this is 2008, 2009, and I was looking, I was looking, there's got to be a better way, and I remember, came across a book called The Millionaire's Real Estate Agents, Mm -hmm. uh, by Gary Keller, the founders of KW, I thought they were genius. I read the book in and out. I read that book 10 times, that's highlighting every single, <laughs> the same book, highlighting every single page. So that's when I start looking for a company, this is back in 2008 or nine, mm-hmm. uh, looking for a company that support the growth of a team. So I was looking, I, got to, I interviewed so many different um, KW officers back then. So it's between KW and Remax. This is back in 2008, 2009. Carl Williams definitely has the team concept. I don't yes. know if Remax did or That not. was the book. The mm-hmm, book that sure. I read, that was like my Bible, basically, back in 2008 uh, on how to grow and develop a team, mm-hmm. right? And then I realized as I go to, so the, the, the concept of a team system, I love it, but then when I go to the real offices, mm-hmm. nobody's actually doing that, right? Because then I realized the idea of a team, it's supposed to be uh, each individual person has a specific role. But mm-hmm. when I went to my interview and go to the real office on the road, like on the ground level, uh, these are actually a bunch of independent solo agents that did exactly what I did uh, when I was, uh, you know, doing the cold well, calling, the mm-hmm. prospecting, and the door knocking. So I don't see any different than becoming a solo agent versus becoming part of a team. So that was, I was like, then I was, okay, that, then, then I kept on looking and I kept on looking, then... The, the Remax office seems to give me flexibility and it seems like they, there was a lot of top producers. So the reason it attracted me to Remax because uh, at that back in 2008 and 2009 is because all, it seems like all the top producers in my area was in that office. So it attracted me to that office sure. because I assume back then there's got to be a system. 
Mm-hmm. And there's got to be a system why all the top producers are there. Or at least people that teach you what they're doing. That's, right? that's, that's my assumption. Right? <laughs> that's my assumption. That's what attracted me there. Mm-hmm. And later on, I realized that had nothing to do with that, but that's a different story. What, later on, I realized that the traditional brokerage is in the business of recruiting agents. So, so the traditional brokerage is in the business of looking at the agents who's doing well, and they recruit, bring agents in, mm-hmm. instead of... Sure bringing people like me who's trying to learn on how to grow and grow it. Mm-hmm. And I was so disappointed when I found out the truth about the real estate industry. I mean, when I'm, when I'm talking about the industry, I'm talking about the traditional brokerage mm-hmm. because the traditional brokerage mindset is to recruit. So I'm going to well, find... a whole lot of people who are not succeeding, so you've got to bring new blood in all the yes. time, right? So I thought, because the idea of franchise, to my understanding, and I was so naive, right? This is back in 2008 and 9, 10. So I was so naive. The idea of franchise, I thought when I get into a franchise, it's like buying a McDonald's franchise where I don't know how to cook. I, don't know, I never own a restaurant in my life. So I'm assuming if I buy a McDonald's franchise, then I'm going to be taught on how to learn how to run a successful business. Right, there's going to be some kind of manual, right? Yes, going to learn but it. then the truth in the traditional real estate brokerage have nothing to do. Uh, there is no franchise. No franch- when I say franchise, I'm talking about a system on how to run the business. You know, I told you this before, if you remember, but I've been licensed for a long time. And I, I, mostly because you have to do that for mortgages. I actually did interview at several offices after I got my real estate license. And you hear all these people say, well, come with you. We'll train you. We'll teach you. And then you find out from all the other agents you talk to that you get to the brokerage. And then they say, oh, well, we're not going to tell you anything until you bring us a deal. Bring us a deal, potential sale. Okay. And then we'll maybe walk you through paperwork. Or maybe we'll have somebody else tell you how to do it. But there was absolutely no training. Just like you were saying. Okay. No training. It's just kind of like recruiting. Yes. To bring the people in and then say, you know, find something for us and then we'll tell you how to do it. Yeah. Which is totally backwards and different from yes. how I thought it was going to be. Right. Exactly like your yes. experience. Yes. And so the training is more like motivational. No, oh, yeah. It's, it's more like making the agents feel good. Well, definitely KW and a bunch of other ones that train. I don't need people to motivate me, you know, because my wife, uh, I have two babies. Mm-hmm. The, like, I have bills to pay. You've done right? a lot of sales I, I don't need to go to a training for somebody <laughs> to motivate me to do it. I'm mm-hmm. just trying to figure out. I'm looking, I was looking for a system on how to build a successful team. So that's, that's my story on going from initially the initial office was an ERA, mm-hmm. that's when it got closed, then I moved to Coldwell Banker, then I was in searching uh, through the Millionaire's Real Estate book, which is a really, really good book till today. I highly recommend mm-hmm. the Millionaire's Real Estate Agents uh, Handbook to, as, as a starting point to launch a team. And then I was looking, uh, going through all the interview process with all the uh, KW office and Remax, and I ended up with Remax. Okay, and with that thing too, it sounds like when you've told me that you wanted to change things a little bit so that other agents did not have to work 24 hours a day or 20 hours a day, seven days a week, and you wanted to have a little bit different value system for your company. Yes, right? yes. Sig, uh, Zig Ziglar is the one who said, back in 2001, when I first get into this personal development, Zig Ziglar was my first mentor, and I remember he said that, if you want to be successful, you got to have, you can have anything in life if you have mm-hmm. enough people to get what they want. Right, so so right. once we'll we figure, get what they want, yes. and you'll get what you want. Right, so that's the that's the concept behind the team model. In order for you to be successful, you have to help other team members to be. The only way, if you want to build a team, and if your perception, if if you have the mindset of a traditional brokerage of taking, that's what recruiting is. You are taking other people production, mm-hmm. then you are not going to be successful. The only way to be successful is you gotta help the other team members to grow. And that's basically what we do here, what we call now uh, the real estate office of the future. We bring in people uh, coming into our system, uh, then no matter who they are, as long as they are coachable, and that's the key word. Uh, it's not that easy looking for people who are coachable in real estate industry, but as long as you are coachable, then uh, the success is guaranteed. Especially if they've come from another brokerage and they do it a whole different way. Yes. You want to teach them and coach them in a whole new way of doing things. Yes, right? because I was in that shoes. But your vision is to make everybody successful and to actually work with them as opposed to throwing them out and saying, do it yourself, right? So yes, because it's all, it's all connected, right? Because I, later on I realized, Julie, I wasn't the only one. I, was the, I wasn't the only one that's working seven days a week, 20, 20 mm-hmm. hours a day. Uh, my situation, my story was my wife with, with, my two, uh, with my two sons. Many real estate agents are facing in the same dilemma. He's, they're working hard. The one that's lazy, we are not talking about it. I'm talking about the one that's doing 
what every the the industry norms and standard ask them them to do. Mm-hmm. Those guys, uh, I want to help, and the reason because I still remember uh, I was in their shoes, and the only, so the and I think the way we set it up now, it's almost impossible for you to fail because the way we set up our team model now is that each individual person has a specific role. We have we have one. So, so when we talk about our team values, our core values here, we, believe, we call it the second mile surface. One of our core values, we have five core values, mm-hmm. but one of them, we call it the second mile surface. Is this The industry norms and standards, they believe, for example, emailing homes. Mm-hmm. Emailing homes to the buyers that the buyers already seen the homes online, there is no value in that transaction. True. As technology becoming more and more advanced, and if all you do, you are emailing homes, and the buyers already seen the homes online, Mm-hmm. Like, what's the use in that transaction? Well, also, people that drive by a property, they see a for sale sign on it, and then they call somebody that they think is their agent and say, hey, I just saw this house, you know, and I'm yes. interested in it. What can you tell me? They've already done some of the work, too. Yes. They found the house, right? Yes. As technology becoming more advanced, we don't need real estate agents to email homes, homes that you can see online. So here in our company, we teach the real estate agents to, in addition to homes that the buyer can see online, we show homes every day, homes that they cannot see online including for sale by owners, bank foreclosure, new home, new constructions. Mm-hmm. Now you did that as a Remax broker and you really built it up and built it up a lot with that, right? Your Remax. Uh, yep, I've uh, been doing that for the past uh, five years and our team has been running as, uh, we, we, we sold about five, 600 transactions in a year. But what's cool about it, there is not a single real estate agent in our company uh, did any type of prospecting or cold call calling, door knocking, no one, zero. That is really amazing. And actually, we're going to get into that a lot more in our second hour when we go on to part two of the real estate office of the future. Uh, Stay tuned. I'm with Rudy Kasuma. This is a really fascinating subject to me as a real estate professional. I've seen so many different people come and go, models come and go. And to think that somebody really doesn't have to do a ton of that work that has been considered to be the main thing that an agent has to do which, let's face it, is marketing, right? And marketing yeah. is very expensive, and it can be, and agents have to do that. Uh, we're going to get into that, because I think that really is the key to how you are different. And I think people are going to be really interested to hear about that, and how it is that you're doing things, and also what you're doing, both in the state of California, and maybe expanding. This is Julie Talks Money, and we are wrapping up our first hour. Stay tuned with us. We're going to be here for a second hour with our very special guest, Rudy Kasuma, your home sold guarantee. You're listening to KCAA, 10.50 a.m. <laughs> Did you well, stand up and do a potty break or anything? <laughs> yeah, are we going straight or can we take a break? No, yeah, we've got like five minutes. Oh, all right, all right. Let's take a break. <laughs> all right, guys. Julie Talks Money. First part of the show. We are going to the second part of the show. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. I'm